So, um, so I'm going to talk about uh, imaging of uh, quantum thermal fluctuation. It's a subject related to let's say observing or measuring quantum system, but uh, it, this will uh, le lead us to make a detour into quantum quantum noise or say classical on quantum noise. Uh, this work has been uh, done with uh, Michel Boer here, and two of, um, in part with two of our students. And it has been inspired by ex some experiments which are done at Ecole Normale in the uh, Serge Arroche group. And in these experiments, they study quantum systems made of photons, which are in inside some cavity. And they analyze, uh, they try to, to analyze this uh, quantum system using matters, uh, atoms. <coughs> and uh, if you look at one of the papers, uh, which was published a few, few years ago, and it's uh, about observing quantum drums uh, for this uh, system of uh, photon in a cavity. So the cavity is a, a few centimeters big. It's a very high quality, and so it selects one frequency of the electromagnetic field. So it's like, uh, so it's like, it's like if you have a quantum system with a, an a, a harmonic oscillator. So there is only one frequency, and the basis of state of your quantum system is just is indexed by the number of photons inside the cavity. <coughs> uh -huh. Yeah. But that's the time I was, so this is the last time I changed uh, the file. Ah. It's not today's time. <laughs> okay. <coughs> so in the, in the paper, you can see this figure was a, so they measure the number of photons inside the cavity. So it's at very low temperature. Sometimes there is no photons, so they observe no photons. Suddenly there is a jump due to thermal activation, and you get one photon, and then Another jump due to again thermal activation, you are back to zero photons. So uh, when you look at this uh, plot, then you you may wonder if, about a few things. That first you you learn that in quantum mechanics, when you observe a system, you have a back action on it. So what does it mean exactly to observe continuously the time, the cavity, and uh, and how you are sure when you observe the that there is no photon, what does it mean? Is there really no photon in the cavity, or is there one? And uh, also, you may wonder what, what is the dynamics of these jumps. So even so, you say that they are generated by thermal fluctuation. Uh, in quantum mechanics, uh, thermal fluctuation have no reality unless you observe them. They become real, real, they have a physical meaning and a physical reality only once you observe them. So what is the dynamic which Govern these jumps. That's the kind of question we would like to answer. So the way they observe the cavity with, without destroying the system, which is inside the cavity, is an, in, in a, using an indirect procedure. So uh, they use they send atoms through the cavity, and they observe the atom. So they do indirect measurement. They never measure directly the cavity. So the setup they have is that they have a system. He has a cavity that they prepare in some given system by injecting some electromagnetic field in it. And then they prepare a bunch of atoms, Rydberg atoms, and they send the, these Rydberg atoms through the cavity. And then they do some measurement on the atom. <coughs> so in their experiment, uh, because of the frequency, frequency which has been selected by the cavity and the structure of the atom, only two levels of the atom are involved in the, in the process of the interaction between the cavity and the atom. So this means that the, this atom behave like an effective spin half system. Then, uh, so this uh, effective spin goes through the cavity, and depending on the state of the cavity, they will interact, and the cavity of the atom and the state get untangled, and then you measure the spin after the cavity. Okay, and you do a fundamental me measurement on the, on the spin. So it means that every time you do 
a phenomenon measurement on the atom, you get some information about the cavity state, but a partial information only. <coughs> but doing that way, you, you are able to do a measurement on the uh, electromagnetic field inside the cavity without destroying them. Because usually it's quite difficult usually to measure light without destroying it. If you use your, your uh, eyes to measure the light, you absorb the photon, you kill the photon. Do you, is, is, it's the same thing if you use any photoelectric apparatus. You absorb the photon, so you kill the system. So using, do, doing this indirect measurement is a way to uh, do some measurement without destroying the system. And this is called a non-demolition measurement in quantum mechanics. <coughs> <coughs> So the, the state of the system after that the uh, atom has gone through the cavity depends on the interaction between the atom and the cavity. So this is coded into the, everything is electromagnetic interaction, but there is some uh, effective description. And the effective interaction for the, syst for the atom, for the interaction is that uh, if there is n photon in the, in th to the cavity, it will rotate the spin of the effective spin of the atom by some angle theta depending on the structure of the cavity. Okay? So this means that if the cavity is in given in a state with a given number of photons, it will remain in a, give, in a state with a given number of photons, but the, the gyroscope as to the, to the <coughs> atom will have be subject to some rotation. And by measuring the angle of the rotation, you learn something about the number of photons into the cavity. So that's what they use to observe this uh, jump. <coughs> another uh, observation they have done, another plot you can find in their uh, paper, is a search uh, plot that I want to explain, because this, is, this would be the basis of our study, in a way. So what is plotted here is, uh, uh, so in this direction is the probability distribution function of the number of photons into the cavity. So assume that you prepare the cavity, electromagnetic cavity, in some given state. So if it's not a pure state, in a, in a state with a fixed number of photons, you have some probability distribution function for measuring a given value of the number of photons. So that would be, that is a probability distribution of the number of the photon into the cavity. And here is time, and the time is measured by the, by, by the, number, by the, the number of photons which goes through the cavity. So it means that there's every microsecond there is one atom which goes through the cavity. So here the number is the number of atoms which goes through the cavity. <coughs> so they prepare the, state, the cavity in some state, then they don't know what is, uh, they have no information about the state of the cavity. So they, they start by the non that, which is a flat distribution. So the first probability distribution function is uh, the flat one, equidistribution of the number into the photon. And you stop about seven because uh, of the experiment, and you don't want to go to infinity. And then you let the atom go through going, you let the atom go through the cavity. So there is one atom which goes through the cavity. You do some measurement, you get some information. Using this information, you can update the, the the probability distribution function of the number of photons into the cavity. Then you go, you let the second atom going, go through the cavity, you get more information, so you update again the distribution function. So every time one an atom goes through the cavity, you update the probability distribution function. And using the information you have got uh, by the measurement. <coughs> so what you see is that during this process of updating, uh, the probability distribution function change every time because you update it, and it, it, it converges to a peak value. It means that after, uh, say, a hundred number of atoms has gone through the cavity, have gone through the cavity, the probability distribution function is peak at the fixed value. So here, with almost probability one, you will find five atoms into the uh, five f five photons in into the cavity. <coughs> But uh, if you do again the same, uh, so you can repeat the same experiment, preparing the cavity in the same way, and letting the atom uh, going through the cavity, and updating the distribution function every time one atom goes through the cavity, 
you will find another evolution for the probability distribution function, but it will still converge to a peak value. But the, p the target here, which is the number of photons toward which it converges, will depend on the realization. So for one re realization, you find five. For another realization, you will find seven. And, so, and if you do a third realization, you will find another value. So this means that these updating are random. And they are random because when you measure the atom, you get some random information because it depends on the output of your measurement on the atom. And by quantum mechanics, this measurement, the value of the measurement is random. But what you see is that uh, this uh, evolution, which are random, so it's like stochastic process, it's a random evolution, always converge to a peak value. So that's the collapse of the wave function. When you, when you do a fundamental measurement, you know that if you find some value, then the wave function collapse. On the, the probability distribution function as to the collapse state is picked. So this is this resembles the collapse of the wave function in, so, in the sense that the probability distribution function collapse. Now you may wonder uh, uh, why you have search evolution and uh, why the effectively the probability distribution function collapse when you every time you update when you update the, this distribution. And you may also wonder uh, whether these uh, probability distribution functions are faithful representation of what is inside the cavity. And what we will see is that it's only at the end of the process when it has collapsed that it's a faithful representation. Every time in between, it's not a faithful representation because it depends on what you started with. Okay, so that's what I want to explain and then use that to learn a little bit about. Uh, Does it, in the, inside the cavity, you have some states, okay? From these states, got some probability distribution function. Ah, the, so you have two dis probability distribution functions, the one which is in, into the, inside the cavity, which is the true one, but you don't know, or that one that you estimate. Does these two distribution functions coincide? The answer is, in general, not, unless they only coincide at the end of the process. Yeah, because you said that the state was not modified by the atom. Right? <laughs> uh, it's a little bit modified. Okay, so that's what I want to explain in the first part of the talk. And uh, so it means that it's to explain this uh, progressive collapse. And then the second part of the talk, I will use this notion to describe what it means to measure the, a system continuously in time, quantum mechanics, and use it to describe uh, quantum and thermal fluctuation. Okay. So let me go through the first part of this talk. So I go, I want to dis discuss again why it collapsed and uh, what does it mean to update the probability distribution function? <coughs> so again, we have, so if we want to abstract a little bit, so we have a quantum system, and then we have probe which go through the, uh, through, the, through the system, and which interact with the system. And the data we got every time we, we do a series of measurements on the probe, we got some output value, which are the value of the uh, result of your probe measurement and this, uh, these values are random because they depend on uh, they come for they depend on the output of the measurement which is random by quantum mechanics <coughs> so the way to update is that you start with some pro you have some you have you start with some probability distribution function let's say step zero which is uniform I call it the trial probability distribution function something that you either you have good guess on it or you don't have so you take it flat whatever it's a trial uh, probability distribution function. Then you do some, some measurement, and so you get one bit of information, and you use this bit of uh, information to update the, this distribution using Bayes rules, means that you have an a priori model for the condition probability to have this output condition of the number of photons, and using this a priori model, you can find the new, new estimation for, for the probability distribution function, condition on the values you get for the output measurement, okay? So this, this, 
if you are at step zero, this one is not random. That's your initial on that, which is flat. This uh, value of the pro uh, probe measurement is random. So you get a random estimate estimation of the probability distribution function into the cavity. OK? <coughs> so that's what you do in practice. You never use quantum mechanics. You start to use just Bayes' rule <coughs> with an a priori model for the condition probability of observing some something on the probe condition on the state of the cavity. And so, and then, what you do with the experiment is that you repeat this updating by using as the second step, you use as a trial probability distribution function the one you find you estimated after the first run. And you keep going many times, OK? So that's purely classical. And when you repeat this process, the, the probability distribution function will collapse. So collapse is nothing quantum. It's just uh, classical. So that's what you do in the experiment. And now what I want to explain is that why is this uh, using Bayes' rule in quantum mechanics is a, in, a, in this experiment is a, is, a, is a good representation of what quantum mechanics will tell you about this the process of interaction plus measurement of the probe. So that's what I, I, I say that I will describe what happens during one cycle. And then after, I will tell you what happens and why you converge when you iterate these cycles. <coughs> so I want to, to show, that's a, the most difficult uh, slide, I think, uh, why quantum mechanics code for Bayes' rule and what happens when you do a cycle of interaction plus probe measurement. So you start with a si your system, which is made of the one probe on the system. So the probe, I call it phi. You prepare the probe in the state phi, always the same for simplicity. And it assumes that at this step, the system is, is in some state psi, which you decompose in some basis, which I call alpha, and in, my ex in the experiment, alpha code for the number of photons. Okay? So it's not a state of fixed number of photons. It's a collection. It's a linear combination. So this means that if you were, we were doing a measurement of the number of photons, we would find some random output with some probability distribution function, which are given by the modulus square of this coefficient. Okay? That's quantum mechanics. So the initial state of our system of probe plus system is just a tensor product of psi time, phi times psi. Now we let the interaction, we let the probe interact with the system during some times, and this is coded in some unitary operator, which I call U. And uh, if you remember in the experiment, this interaction was such that if there was a fixed number of photons into the cavity, the cavity remained in a fixed number of photons. So the interaction operator was exponential, was a rotation on the effective spins with the angle depending on the number of photons. OK? So it means that it, it preserves states which, are, which have a fixed number of photons. So that's what we will assume, that these uh, unitary, op unitary operators preserve the, the state of the cavity if this state is a fixed, is a, pure, is a simply a state alpha, so a state with a fixed number of photons. OK? So we, we do this hypothesis because at the end, what we want to measure is some observable. So the iteration, the, the model of uh, interac iteration of interaction plus measurement is a model of, me of a, a measurement apparatus. So we want to measure some observable. And this observable has some eigenstates. So we want to, to uh, preserve that the interaction preserves these eigenstates of the observable we are supposed to measure. Because if we want to, if we measure some observable and we collapse on some state alpha, and we measure it again, but we will find the again the, the, the value alpha with probability one. So it has to be preserved by the apparatus. So we preserve this. Uh, we assume that there is some basis of states which are preserved by the interaction, and these are called pointer states. So if you do this modeling, if you use this modeling of the interaction, then when you let the system plus the probe interact, you act on U on this tensor product. So by linearity, it acts on, it becomes the, 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 the linear combination of 
C of some st of the action of u on the tensor product of phi times alpha with some coefficient, the same coefficient C alpha. And on the tensor product by alpha times phi, the interaction leave alpha on as an effect on the state phi of the probe. That's my, that was my rotation. So that's the state of the system after the interaction. And now you measure the probe. On, you measure an observable only on the probe. So you, measure, you act on this part of the system, and you will collapse the fundamental measurement. So you collapse the state of the probe here, not on the state alpha. But because the probe on the state have been entangled, this, uh, this projection, fundamental projection, has a tiny effect on the, on the state of the cavity. So if I find i as an output of the measurement of the probe measurement, I will collapse the probe on the state i, and I collapse all these states, so it modifies a little bit uh, the state of the cavity. It changes the amplitude with a matrix element, which is a matrix element of the interaction with between five and the state i that you find by the measurement. So it means that the probe, uh, the state of the cavity has changed a little bit. It has been, it has not collapsed fully because it's uh, only an indirect measurement. It has changed a little bit. And at the same, so this implies that the new probability distribution function inside the cavity has changed a little bit because now it's given the probability distribution of the number of photons is a square of this new amplitude. And the modulus square of a product is a product of modulus square. So it's, the modulus square is the modulus square of C, which is Q0, times the modulus square of this uh, uh, coefficient, which I call pi alpha, which is a condition probability of finding i if the cavity was in a state alpha. So this means that the new probability distribution function is proportional to Q0 times this condition probability, and this is Bayes' rule. So, say, in other words, Bayes' rule, quantum mechanics implies Bayes' rule, so it's a uh, it's a faithful implementation of quantum mechanics to use Bayes rule to implement uh, the probability distribution function. Sorry, Denis. Denis, right. where did the phi go? Phi. Yeah. Phi is here. Yes, but in the end. Huh? In the end, in the last. In the last formula, because P, this condition probability depends on. Oh, that's phi here. Yeah. That's phi. So it's effectively the condition probability. Imagine that C was one for one given value of alpha, pick. Then, so it's, uh, so there was, one, there was no sum here, there was only one term alpha. So the state after, if, after measurement will be just, there's no sum of alpha, okay? And that will be the probability, and this coefficient will be the probability to find i of the, for the measurement. So it's effectively the condition probability of finding i given the state of the cavity. Z of i is the sum of pi alpha for alpha? Z of phi is normalization. Yeah. <coughs> but this is Bayes' rule. So quantum mechanics code for Bayes' rule, so you can update the probability distribution function using Bayes' rule. On, and then, okay. And then the process of this uh, system, in, uh, which which is uh, lead to the progressive collapse, is just iterating this uh, updating, which are random, as I said. <coughs> So if you want to for, uh, formulate it a little bit differently, you say that since now it's classical, you forget about quantum mechanics, and the data are in the initial distribution fun probability distribution function, Q0, and you a priori, your a priori condition probability, which depends on the interaction. So it's probability to find some measurement, output me measurement, given the state of the cavity. And then you update recursively the probability distribution function, uh, using Bayes' rule, and the updating are random because the value at stage n, so finding some output, depend is uh, arise with some probability p n, which is uh, because of quantum mechanics. So that's now what I want to look to to analyze and see what happened to this distribution probability when n when you iterate the process when you increase the number of steps uh, in this. Uh, process. And the claim uh, that we have is that uh, first if you start with a peak distribution function, 
initially, so it's picked. Then it will remain picked for every, at every steps, for every n. And this is by construction because I choose uh, the interaction, I choose a model in which the interaction preserves the state of the cavity if this state was in a, with a given number of photons. So, but if initially it's not picked at large n, when n goes to infinity, it will become picked. And this is, since this uh, number are random, it depends on the realization of the output you got. It's a conver it's a con it converts to a peak value which is random. And the convergence is almost sure in the proper in your probability space and in L1. So that's the collapse. By doing this random updating, the probability distribution function collapse. And then now you can ask what is the probability to collapse to a given target? And the probability to collapse to a given target is given by the initial probability distribution function. So that's fundamental rules for measurement. You collapse to a given target according to the initial probability distribution function. <coughs> but uh, contrary to what we learn uh, in books, where the collapse is uh, abrupt when you do a measurement, it's a progressive collapse because you do indirect measurement and you ca we can evaluate the speed the, at which it collapses. So it's an exp if you look at the, if you collapse to some target like, which I call gamma, this means that Qn of gamma will become one and Qn of alpha, alpha different from gamma will go to zero and it goes to zero exponentially fast. And the rate of this decrease is some relative entropy uh, associated to the trial probability distribution function. OK, so this means that uh, random updating is a, uh, using Bayes rule is a good model for the quantum collapse. So I will just tell you a word how to prove it. But first, I would want to make a few comments is that first, what we learned from that uh, when we have tried to understand what uh, Serge Arosh has done is that uh, this uh, mo model of, of iterated interaction and poor measurement is uh, some kind of mesoscopic measurement apparatus because it's, uh, it's meso mesoscopic because it becomes macroscopic only when a large number of atoms has gone through the cavity. And um, so it's why the why it's called transition from classical to quantum because it's uh, it's become system become classical only when you have large you have a macroscopic system interacting with the system when you have a large number of atoms going through the cavity this large number of atoms makes is behave like a macroscopic system so then at the, at when you have a large number of atoms you are looking at the interaction of a macroscopic system with your tiny quantum system made of the cavity. And then a uh, few, uh, few, I think two years after we work on that, and uh, six years after uh, Arosh experiment, I read uh, in a paper of David Mermin that, so he, he wrote that the collapse is nothing more than the updating of that calculation device on the basis of additional experience, which is exactly what, what this experiment is doing. We update uh, our knowledge every time so using the additional information we have on the system every time the, we, got, we measure the probe. <coughs> so, uh, okay. And then we, uh, before describing how to prove the, that statement, you may also wonder what happens if you don't record the data of your output. So you let, you have the system, you let the probe going through the system, you measure them. So they have an effect on the system. But you don't record the data. You forget to note everything. So then what you, you can see that in mean, so, it's, so it means that if you don't record the system, it means that the collection of atoms behave like, again, like a reservoir. And because you don't record the data, you are, you are tracing out the degree of freedom of the reservoir. And what you expect is decoherence, because you have a tiny system in contact with a large reservoir. And that's what you, you can check if you look at uh, recursive iteration of the interaction plus pro measurement as I described, you will see that the density matrix 
of the diagonal ele elements are conserved in mean, but the off diagonal element decreases exponentially fast. So if you don't, in mean, if you don't record the, the data and you trace over the degrees of freedom, you converge to a density matrix, which is diagonal. So you have decoherence. OK, so, uh, so I think analyzing this experiment, we understand better what it means to measure in uh, to the measurement in quantum mechanics, and th th that uh, we will use it to to discover what it means to measure continuously in time now, because we we can iterate this procedure of uh, discrete interaction of interaction plus cycle as much as we want. But before going to that, I want to describe how to prove it. So we had our uh, distribution function, which are random, so they define a process. So n is, is associated to the value qn for fixed alpha, let's say, that's a random process, which is defined in some probability space with a filtration associated to the number of, of photons going through the cavity. And the measure on this probability space is the one induced by quantum mechanics. So you have filtered probability space. And what you can check is that these qn are martingales. So they, and they are bounded martingale because they are between 0 and 1. And this is why they they converge because there is a theorem which tells you that if you have a bond on Martingale, it converges most surely on in L1. So the fact that there are bond uh, Martingale means that the, the mean condition, the mean and the value at the step n, condition on the value at the condition on the value up to step n minus one included, is equal to the value of the variable at step n minus one. So more or less in physical terms, it means that Qn in mean are conserved. <coughs> so, uh, so that proves that they converge, and then you look at the fixed point, and it's kind of assuming some non, non degeneracy uh, hypothesis, it's necessarily a peak distribution function. And then the fact that it con converges exponentially fast with the rate coded by the entropy is linked to the fact that if it converges, it becomes a peak value. It means that your state of the cavity is almost, uh, is close to a state with a fixed number of photons, say. So this means that the output, uh, the output data, which corresponds to the measurement of the output probe, are independent, variab independent variable and identically distributed. So the frequency of occurrence of some given value for the output is proportional to n, with a coefficient which depends on the probability, uh, or the condition probability, condition on the target states. And using that, th this hypothesis, this, uh, this fact, you can prove that the QN converges exponentially fast. So that proves this collapse. And again, it's purely classical. Actually, it doesn't prove exactly, it doesn't explain completely the experiment. Because in what I have done is that I started, when I did the discussion uh, concerning the description of the quantum, the quantum mechanical description of the interaction on the system, I started with the state of the cavity, which actually I don't know. Uh, on his asset distribution Q0. So this updating is an updating using Q0 as a starting initial value, but I don't know Q0. So my proof doesn't work to explain the experiment. But what you can prove is that actually, if you do the same updating, but with another Q0, but using the same realization of the output uh, measurement, you will converge to the same target with the same speed of convergence, and that is it's independent of the initial value Q0. So that way you can prove it, and that's important to explain the experiment, because initially you don't know the initial value of Q0. You start with a Q0 that you don't know, which is not the true one. So it means that initially the Q0, the distribution you started with, has nothing, nothing to do with what is inside the cavity. So it means that the Qn that you compute using Bayes' rule has nothing to do, or is not equal to the Q0, the true one. It's only at the end of the process that you have an e equality between the two distribution functions, the one you estimate and the one which is represent what is inside the cavity. OK, that's enough for the explaining this exper experiment. But, uh, but before using it to describe uh, uh, how to, to measure quantum and thermal fluctuation, I want to spend a few two minutes on to tell you why this uh, kind of experiment fits in a larger framework linked to quantum noise. Um, 
if you have a, a process, let's say for a, in some manifold, so you have a you have a process of t to xt in some manifold m. So you start with the initial point at x0, and then you evolve. It's a random process, so it depends on some realization with omega in some uh, measurable space. You have some random trajectory, okay, which depends on the realization of the process. For example, you can think about a, a random walk. on Z, so you have the lattice, and you start with position X0, and then you move, by one step, you, so you move many times. So that's your work on Z. So what you see is that when you look at such process, for the random walk, all the information are on the random variable, which are at step g, is plus or minus 1. So in a random process, all the information is in the noise. OK? It's a bit of a paradoxical way of saying it, but more or less, the, what is not in the noise is only the initial position. So all the information is in the noise. So <coughs> And this the notion of noise is uh, associated to a notion of uh, narrow of time, which is a number of data uh, of steps, if you want. And this notion, this arrow of time is associated to the notion of filtration in your probability space. Now, if you want to look at the non-commutative setup for that, what you have? You have the manifold M. And associated to this manifold, you have the algebra of function on M which will be a way to test the position of the starting point. Okay? So in the quantum case, that's uh, the algebra function on M becomes the algebra of observable on your Hilbert space H of the system. And then you have all the data with plus minus one in the random walk on function which test, test the value plus the, the the value of this random variable, plus minus one, and you can test, let's say, the n first one. That will be associated to the algebra of observable on the n first probe. Okay? So that's set up of an interaction, a system interacting with a series of probes. It's just a non commutative analog of the setup used in discrete random processes. On, so that's a quantum analog one. And if you don't do any measurement, what you get after n steps, you get something, a state which is in the tensor product of the Hilbert space times the tensor product of the n first Hilbert space, which will be the same thing as getting a function. If you look at the n first observable of the n first times, you will look at a function f at the initial position on the, the variable of the sign, a variable up to time n. <coughs> now, uh, OK, so that's what you do if you don't do any measurement. Now, in quantum, in quantum mechanics, if you do measurement on this observable, you will get random variables. So you will get numbers, which are random, and which will be the analog of the epsilon 1. And so you are back to classical. If you do measurement, you are back to classical proce processes. And this is called quantum trajectories. In the this framework. The spin chain of some kind? Random work is uh, on the lattice. Yes, sir, but you might but you say you have a quantum version of that, so you have a tensor product. Of, so every, every, at every step, you, you yeah. multiply through the space by another? Yeah, by C2, if you want. Yeah, yeah. So I take HS, will be one, I don't know, your favorite Hilbert space. And then you take the probe as spin half, as I did in the experiment. So every time, so you will add tensor product by C2. Okay. Okay. So this means that okay, this uh, experiment is a larger fit in this uh, notion of quantum no noise, and I think there is a nice uh, there is a nice structure behind in uh, playing with this uh, notion of quantum noise because it makes probability theory and quantum mechanics, and even you can think about mixing them with field theory, and uh, nice structure. I think. At least to play with. 
So uh, I don't have time. I wanted to talk about the classical interpretation of pointer state. So, uh, <coughs> so there is many generalization. In, in particular, there is application. Since you get information on the system, you can use this information to act back on the system. So you can manipulate the system. That's what people do in experiments. What I want to use as an application is try to, as I said, try to use this framework to describe time continuous measurement in quantum mechanics. Uh, <coughs> and it's only when you do this time continuous measurement that you can reveal the quantum jumps. So otherwise, as I said, they don't have any physical reality. So uh, as you all learn, if you do a measurement continuously in time in quantum mechanics, you fold all the dynamics. So we, what we, when we say time continuous measurement, we don't mean Feynman measurement continuously in time, because this will freeze the dynamics. So what we have in mind is that we have the system, which e evolve uh, according to this, is its dynamic, either Hamiltonian, if it's uh, at zero temperature, or some dissipative dynamic, if it's in contact with the reservoir. So you have these dynamics. On every tiny second, you do an indirect measurement the way I described. You have another system, and you measure the other system. So you do an indirect measurement. And if the time step between this indirect measurement and the time, time step involved in the Hamiltonian uh, or in the dissipative dynamics uh, are, quite di are, are very different. So if the time step between each uh, interaction is much, much smaller than the typical time scale involved in the dynamic, yeah, then you can use a time continuous uh, description of the process. And that's what is called by time continuous measurement of quantum systems. <coughs> So the way to describe it is that every time you do a measurement, so you update the probability distribution function according to the rules that I described, which can be summarized as conjugating the density matrix by some operator f and normalizing it with the probability to find the output i, which is random. So that's a random evolution because the i are random and distributed with some probability, which is just the normalization factor of these uh, density matrices. So that's the indirect measurement. And so you iterate the measurement, the random measurement, on the evolution. Okay, and that's defined for you a new stochastic process acting on density matrices. So in the time continuous uh, formulation, the density matrices will evolve. There will be two terms in the evolution. One, one associated to the let's say, Hamiltonian evolution, if you are at zero temperature, and one associated to the measurement, the one I just described before. This one is random. This one is not random. Okay. <coughs> and uh, if you your probe are spin half, as uh, Nikita said, so they are described by a spin. And the output you go got every time you do a measurement is a series of spin plus minus minus plus. So this is in one-to-one -one correspondence with random work. So when you take continuous limit of of them, this will be coded in the time, it's natural that the time continuous limit of this random work will be associated to some Brownian motion. So if you, there is a clean way to do it, but then the time continuous, time continuous limit of this iteration of measurement is described by some evolution which is driven by some Brownian motion with a drift term and a, and a noisy term with a diffusion constant which depends on the states. Okay? So that's called uh, Belafkin e equation, which were, were known in the 80s. <coughs> so uh, in particular, we have seen that in an uh, example of the cavity, the, the probability distribution function, so the diagonal matrix elements, are martingale under this process. So this means that the drift term vanishes if you look at the diagonal matrix element of, of the density matrices. So if I have a, a two, uh, two-level system with two levels 0 and 1. And if I want to measure the observable, which is diagonal in 0 and 1, the diagonal matrices element of rho in this, in this basis, let's say q, which is a diagonal along 0, has to be a martingale. So this term has to vanish if I look at the matrix element 0, 0. So dq has to be proportional to dbt because it's a martingale. And this one is quadratic, and it has to vanish for q equal to 0 because that's if I am in a pure state of the observable I measure 
I have to stay in it, and it has to vanish if q is 0 and q is 1, so it's proportional to these factors. Well, the coefficient of proportionality is the speed at which you collapse if you were evolving the system. Okay? So that's just a time continuous limit of what I described before. Now you can see uh, what happened to the evolution of your matrices when you do continuous measurement in time with Hamiltonian evolution or with dissipative evolution. So if you do, if you observe the system which evolves unitarily, so at zero temperature, uh, and you measure it continuously in time, two things happen. So if there was no measurement, you know that the two-level system oscillates, there's the Rabi oscillation. Everybody, you learned that at school. So it means that if the time to really accomplish the measurement, so the time to collapse, it's much bigger than the times of the Rabi oscillation, you have no time to do the measurement. So you don't really much deform the Rabi oscillation. And you see what you see here is what is, you see oscillation. So what is plotted here is the component of the state uh, in the basis 0, 1 of the density matrices. So if the time scale of the collapse is much bigger than the time scale of the unitary evolution, you have Rabi oscillation. Uh, slightly random, so they are zigzag because you do, you act on the system a little bit be because of the indirect measurement. But in the opposite situation, if you, if the time scale, time of the collapse is much bigger, much smaller than the time scale of the evolution, you have the jump. It means that the state, you measure the system very quickly, so it collapses. So it has a tendency to collapse to zero or one. But since it's a, the, the collapse is not completely accomplished, because it's never accomplished, the time evolution has time to, to do something, and sometimes you collapse back to the other value. So you jump from zero to one. And this has been observed. <coughs> so that's uh, uh, the jump at zero temperature as to the measurement of the process continuously in time. And the time scale between the two actually diverge with the times of the collapse. Because if the time, w the time to collapse was close to zero, it means that you really have time to collapse completely uh, almost in, 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 in such a way, you will collapse, the system will stay in the state, against the state of the Hamiltonian, and you will come. <coughs> so that's a uh, manifestation of the Zeno effect. But what I want to describe is what happens when the evolution is not unitary, but when the system is in contact with the reservoir. So again, you have a system, quantum system, in contact with the reservoir at some temperature, and you measure it indirectly, continuously in time. Okay? So if you prepare, what you, you know is that if you prepare the system as a high energy state, that will be a cascade. Uh, Toward, uh, and if the reservoir is at very low temperature, there is a cascade of energy toward small energy. So that's what you observe. You will see the energy. Here is what is plotted the energy as a function of time. It starts with a very high value, and then it collapses by jump. And then when it has reached almost zero, it, because the reservoir is at very low temperature, there is a few quantum jumps. So the way to describe it is, again, the same thing as, same as before. You have some kind of dissipative evolution, which is uh, described uh, it's a generalization of the unitary evolution. It's called a quantum uh, dynamical, uh, quantum completely positive map. So it's uh, some kind of uh, quantum uh, dynamical map on quantum system preserving positivity and a bit more. And that's what uh, it's a good description of a quantum evolution of a quantum system in contact with the reservoir. So that's dissipative, it's not unitary because uh, there is a sum. There is, if there was only one term in the sum, it would be unitary. If there is more than one term, it's not unitary. And then, as, as you to that, you have the measurement every time step, you measure it a bit indirectly, the way I described before. So you couple the two processes, the, the dissipative evolution and the measurement, and you iterate the process. And you want to see what happens. So what you see is that, again, is the, if the time of the collapse is very much smaller than the times needed to relax, to the thermodynamical time to relax, um, you will find jump. And to describe them, it's simpler to go to the continuum limit. So the continuum limit, you have 
thermal evolution of the density matrices, which will relax to the Gibbs, to, towards the Gibbs states if there was no measurement. And then you have a random evolution, which is linked to the measurement. So again, this one, uh, the, the random evolution associated to the measurement is driven by a Brownian motion, which code for the output of the measurement. And the uh, relaxation term is linear and should converge to Gibbs states. So if there was no, not this term, Q, which is a component of the density matrix, will converge to the Gibbs states. But because of this uh, drift term, what you will observe is that uh, you will observe the jump. It means that uh, your density matrices will spend a lot, lot of time at Q close to zero, where the states will be close to uh, one, because Q is zero. And then suddenly we jump to a value close to one with oscillate, with a noisy contribution because of the random effect of the measurement. And you jump from so state one to state zero to state one to state zero. And you can fully analyze. So these jumps are just induced by the, the measurement. They are not in the dynamic. There is no jump, jumpy dynamic into the into the process. Everything is, uh, if you look at the evolution of that, it's not uh, as yet to a Poisson process. Uh, the jump are generated by the dynamic. It's more or less like a Kramer's uh, process where you jump from one minima of a potential to another one, and the jumps are induced by the, by the noise. But this noise is not put by hand. It's just due to the effect of the measurement that you do on the system. And then you, so you can analyze it completely. And so what you can see, for, for instance, that Contrary to what happened at zero temperature, when you look at the zeno effect, the time scale between the jump remains finite when the time to collapse goes to zero. And they are proportional to the relaxation ter uh, time. This time, the time span at close to the state one or close to the state zero. And the ratio are given by the Gibbs factor as it should by ergodicity. But also what you can, so you can compute everything but the statistic of this jump. But uh, what you can check also is that the dynamic, uh, you can learn something about the dynamic of this jump. So these jumps are not instantaneous like uh, we learn in school. They are, uh, for example, there is a typical finite time to jump from zero to one. And this time is proportional to the collapse time. So it goes to zero, it's very small, but there is logarithmic correction. And the fact that it's proportional to the collapse time means that the dynamics of the jump are depending on the way you observe the system. So quantum jumps, is what I said, are not physical reality. They depend on the way you observe them. It's, uh, okay. So then you can learn more about them. And what you, okay. and, um, what you can do now is try to, uh, to do it's what, what we are trying to do now is to go to more general situation. In particular, to out of equilibrium situation where you have two reservoirs, and so you have a transfer between the two reservoirs, the transfer of charge of energy, and observe continuously in time this transfer and look at the statistic of that. And that's done experimentally, where people look, observe the transport of charge in quantum dots. And uh, so, and you can fully describe this, uh, this transfer. Okay, thank you. Can one understand the temperature of the sitter space along these lines? So just <laughs> <laughs> yesterday's talk by Polikov, he said something to the effect that if you look at the true uh, density matrix of, uh, of evolved from initial state, it's actually it's a pure state, but if you do it cross grain, it becomes a thermal state. So it, uh, as if it depends on the way you approach. Um, I think it's not exactly analog because, um, if I understand correctly, so what uh, Polyakov was describing is that uh, you are in a background which depends on time. Okay, so it's why you have uh, this effect. Okay, well. but it was it was look at the unitary evolution. You, you never observe the system. It just says that if I, if I want to observe something at, at some time, then I will observe between t and t plus delta t. So I have to have a range on that kilo some terms. And you have a, 
a response which is effectively described by a density matrix, which is not the same thing as here, where you observe it continuously in time. So because it's quantum mechanics, every time you, because you observe it continuously in time, you, you have a back action on the system, which is not coded into a, what Polyakov was describing yesterday. 